Neil Condon is an Oscar-winning writer and director. He won an Oscar for Gods and Monsters. He's also directed Dream Girls, the live-action Beauty and the Beast. He also directed the last two Twilight films, but we won't hold that against him. His current film is in cinemas now. It's called The Good Liar and stars Ian McKellen and Helen Mirren. Ian McKellen plays this, you know, kind of swarthy con man. It's a nice little throwback, twisty, tourney thriller, and I was lucky enough to speak to him about the film, so enjoy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? I'm well, and you? Not too bad at all. Um, just want to ask you, you've worked, obviously, with um, Sir Ian McKellen on Gods and Monsters, Beauty and the Beast, uh, and Mr. Holmes. When you have a, a connection to an actor like that, do you actively seek out roles for you to collaborate on, or is it just like a happy coincidence that you find material that you think suits him? Absolutely, actively seek it out. And that's, you know, this was a um, a book, the producer Craig Yolen gave it to me, and that was a huge part of what was appealing to us, the um, the fact that we could work with him again. Peter Jackson has done it six times. I think he's cheating because he it's only The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. It's really only two. But I really am in this race with him. I'm going to beat him. I'm going to get to seven. So... <laughs> And another person obviously you cast was uh, Helen Mirren, and it, it's one of those yes. team ups that I know they they done a play. I think it was uh, Dance of Death uh, a couple of years ago. It just seems like one exactly. of those collaborations that you think you've seen before, but you haven't. From I know. What I think though, a real difficult part to cast is, is Russell Tovey in that because when you have people like Helen Mirren and Ian McKellen, it, it, I'd say it's very easy to be blown off the screen with them. Was that a, a difficult role to cast? It was, and thank you. I'm so glad you said that about Russell Tovey because I think he's the secret sauce in this movie um, because, yes, he's got... Uh, I mean, first of all, how great an actor is he? I don't know if you're a fan of years and years, but I, I'm yeah. mildly obs obsessed with it. But it's just one of many things that he's done. Um, but I have to say, too, that when you finally show the movie to the people at Warner Brothers, they ask three times during the movie, who is he? They, you know, he still is unknown by, you know, in the movie world in a way, and people are blown away by him. But yeah, Russell, um, you're absolutely right. Someone who can go toe to toe with them, hold his own. But also, I thought what's kind of great about him is, it, you know, the movie's called The Good Liar, and everyone's got all of these you know, stories to tell and they're pretending to be somebody else. Russell, of course, is pretending a little bit, but it is his authenticity, isn't it? That really, you know, sort of gives him this weight, especially against, um, you know, uh, Ian, who is being so crafty all around him. Um, and two, it was a part that, you know, in other hands could be a, a, a sort of, you know, I think the word you guys use is wet, you know, but the sort of academic, yeah. um, the, you know, uh, a little superior. And the fact that Russell plays him, you know, in in his accent as an, in jeans, you know, that's what academics look like these days. I thought it was, I, I don't know, I'm very grateful to, for him to have taken on this part. And especially with that role, when you have someone like, I know Ian McKellen's essentially the bad guy, but because he's so beloved, it'd be very easy for that to be, oh, I'll get this character out of the way, I want to see, you know, the bad guy win, essentially. Exactly. No, it's true. And um, yeah. that I kind of seen as like a, a recurring theme throughout a lot of your films is um, the concept of aging and mortality. And I think that's yes. a, such a, a big part in The Good Liar as well. What about that particular aspect of the storytelling appeals to you? Yeah, I, I, I know for me, um, from a young age, but throughout my adulthood, I've always had good friendships with people who are older and really, really so much of I've gained so much from it. You know, filmmakers who are older, for example, Curtis Harrington is someone I, when I first went to Los Angeles and he'd been friends with James Whale. So I'd heard all of those Whale stories for years and years. Um, and then likewise, you sort of try to then have younger friends on the other side. But, but, um, it was, it has been interesting because I first really played with this in, gods and monsters and i was in my 40s but now i'm in my 60s and getting <laughs> getting getting it's getting a little more pressing these issues um so it it i i do think of it as being hopefully it will it, i won't be surprised when these <laughs> when these things finally come to bear because it's something i've been thinking about for a long time but i i think you know what what really appeals to me about this movie is that while those issues sort of hang over everything. It is a movie with, with characters in their 70s and in Ian's case, 80, um, 
that ha- that places them right in the swim of things. You know, they have agendas. They're really trying to pull something off. They're really, in many ways, at the top of their game, you know. And it's not about hospital visits and diagnosis of imminent mortality. You know, it. it so it was fun to do something like this, but actually then not focus on that. There is, and there's that great line where he has the discussion with Vincent where he's saying it's about the money, and Vincent kind of says, well, you know, I don't think it's about the money anymore. It's about, you know, a feeling of usefulness, essentially, despite the, the terrible it, things. Exactly. Yes, that's very true. This is a kind of film that I've been kind of championing, that the mid-budget film seems to be disappearing. Yep. You've done things like, you know, yep. The Good Liar, Fifth Estate, Mr. Holmes. But you've also done, you know, the blockbusters like the Twilight series and Beauty and the Beast. In light of kind of the you know, Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola's comments during the week, do you find it yeah. harder now to make films like this? I, I watched an interview with you recently around the time Gods and Monsters came out and you were talking yeah. about how storytelling seems to be coming to the fold again. Do you think it's yeah. progressed somewhat slightly in, in the light of you know the, the big blockbuster movies? Yeah, I do. I do think that it's harder and I, I, I sort of can't believe, I feel as though we got in under some wire with Good Liar, frankly, you know, because, um, and let's see, let's hope it do, it does well, but it does feel like these movies have been appropriated by streaming services, frankly, and that, the, you know, now I have to say, I, I, I'm lucky in that one of the three or four kinds of movies that still really appeals in theaters are music driven movies and that they appeal to me, you know, in the way that you know, Marvel movies wouldn't. So thank God there is still a niche out there. But I guess the question becomes, well, two things I would say. One of them is, um, if you look at what Netflix is releasing in the next few months, you know, it's Dolomite and the two popes and marriage story and the Irishman and look back at recent studio history, any studio that's like United artists in the sixties and seventies. I mean, to have those four movies in the space of two months, it's sort of remarkable. No matter who they are, right? Yeah. So those are real movies that are being made by them um, that will, you know, obviously then it becomes about the theatrical experience, but you're grateful that they exist. At the same time, like I look at a movie like this and I think part of the pleasure of, you know, a, a twisty, turny thriller with, with uh, surprises and uh, plot twists and mystery is, is that kind of communal ooh and ah that happens when people finally get it, you know? And if you don't get that, you know, when you're watching it at home. So it's, it's a complicated moment. I don't think we've, I don't think we really know where it's going to land yet. You know, I think it's in transition, but, but for right now, but yes, the moment is not great for uh, getting these kinds of movies. Um, not so much made as seen and, and, you know, uh, getting the audience to go to them and get in the habit of going to them. There, and you, you said there about the, the audience experience. Like for me, I, I love films like The Usual Suspects or The Spanish Prisoner, yes. which I think really this film really reminded me of. And there is, uh-huh. like you said, that audience moment where, not to give anything, where there's certain reveals during you do get that wave of oohs and ahs that you, you don't get watching it at home as well. It's true, and I found, I found in my three experiences now that as the people come out of the theater, they're talking about it, right? Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is, it, that's what you want, right? Yeah, you, also, you, you spoke there, sorry, about James Whale and, of course, uh, the story of Gods and Monsters. Um, Bride of Frankenstein with, with Javier Bardem, yeah. is there any status update on that? Is that still happening? It is not happening, I think, you know, um, sadly. You know, it was, I think it was kind of left open-ended but it's really you know the mummy happened and there's a whole sense of reviving those monsters and that sort of made everybody have second thoughts everybody at universal it's a heartbreaker because we were onto something really special i think david kep had written a, a really cool script and and um something i think might have re- brought the the whale sensibility of the original movie into the 21st century but at a big budget and i think now they're thinking more that as they do it slowly across the years that it's going to be more bloomhouse level you know uh style size movies which is fine you know but yeah that was a bit of a we were sort of you know gearing up and going and then it 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 fell apart so that'll always remain a regret uh, you mentioned there about um, the the script. Obviously, you started off as a, a screenwriter yourself, and actually wrote yeah. one of my favorite films. I, I grown up, I had Ghostbusters, Batman, and FX Two. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Brian Brown giving an interview saying that there was a script for a third film, and it was being made. Of course, this is kind of pre-internet, and it just disappeared into the ether. Was there actually ever an FX Three? 
No, I don't think there was. I think, I, honestly, and Brian, God, I remember this so well. Brian, he was an entrepreneurial, yes, and he, he was producing films in Australia, but FX2 was happening, and he really thought FX was going to be his Indiana Jones or something, and then it became clear as the movie was about to be released that both the reviews and the box office weren't supporting that. And I remember, I've never, I've always sort of held on to this memory of him just like saying, you know what, mate, uh, you just, just, you take a different path then. And he, he, he moved back to Australia. He's made movies there, but he sort of dropped out of it, you know, um, in a way, in a very, he, he just accepted it as, as either, it either works or it doesn't. Hopefully. But I have a Bluey the Clown down in the basement at home, so I could, I could, um, send you a picture of him oh, with, the, with the message if you want. Please put that on Insta or Twitter. So I'm I can see that. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> no, Colin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. The film. Best of luck. Oh, thank you, Andy. Thanks. Have a Thanks good day. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. Bye.